Welcome everyone. My name is Adriana Link, and I am the Head of Scholarly Programming at the American Philosophical Society. The Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance, and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who have offered their guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. Welcome to the third day of our virtual conference, Relationships, Reciprocity, and Responsibilities, Indigenous Studies in Archives and Beyond. We are so glad that you have joined us today. A reminder that our conversation will continue tomorrow with two sessions at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Eastern Time, and that a full program may be found on our website. We will also be recording these sessions, which will be available on the Society's YouTube channel after the event. This week's conference is inspired by the important work of the APS's Center for Native American and Indigenous Research and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation-funded Native American Scholars Initiative. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The Society promotes research by providing over a million dollars in research grants a year, especially to those younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Please check our website to learn more about what we do and for news of upcoming events. We are using Zoom webinar for today's program, so do not worry, you have all been muted. If you have a question, we do ask that you please use the Q&A button that's located at the center of your screen. Uh, you can type your question there at any time uh, during the event, and there will be time at the end of the panel, probably about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, to engage with questions with our speakers. We will share any unanswered questions with them at the end of the event, and we'll work to make their responses available to you on our website. We are excited to offer closed captioning for this conference. If you would like to use it during this discussion, please click on the CC box at the bottom of the navigation bar of your screen. It is to the right of the Q&A button. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Jenny Davis, who will be moderating today's second panel on community-based language revitalization. Jenny Davis is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and an Associate Professor of Anthropology and American Indian Studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where she is the Director of the American Indian Studies Program and the Chancellor's Fellow of Indigenous Research and Ethics. Her research focuses on language revitalization, indigenous gender and sexuality, and collaborative methods, ethics, and repatriation in indigenous research. She is the author of numerous scholarly and creative publications, as well as the recipient of two book prizes, the 2019 Beatrice Medicine Award from the Association for the Study of American Indian Literatures, for which she received for her book, Talking Indian, Identity and Language Revitalization in the Chickasaw Renaissance, published by University of Arizona Press in 2018. In 2014, she received the Ruth Benedict Book Prize from the Association for Queer Anthropology and the American Anthropological Association for her co-edited volume, Queer Excursions, Retheorizing Binaries in Language, Gender, and Sexuality, which was published by Oxford University Press that same year. Welcome, Jenny. Great to have you here. Hi, Chokma uh, and Chokma uh, for the introduction. So, um, Hotifa, uh, Jenny Davis, Chikasha Saya, Oklahoma, I mean, Tali. Hi, everyone. Um, as Adriana mentioned, uh, my name is Jenny Davis. I'm very excited to be here. I wanted to extend a thank you to the organizers and also to the panelists who I'm very excited to hear um, give their talks today. And uh, my first job here is to do an introduction. I'll be introducing everyone on the panel um, all at once at the beginning and then they'll give their individual papers. So our first paper um, will be jointly presented by Patricia Anderson and Elizabeth Pierit Mora. Patricia Anderson has been an active member of the Tunica Language Project since 2011. Her upcoming book, Revitalization Lexicography, The Making of the New Tunica Dictionary, details her work as head lexicographer of the New Tunica Dictionary and looks at the roles dictionaries can play in language revitalization efforts. 
In addition to preparing the print Tunica Dictionary, Dr. Anderson created the Tunica Dictionary app for Android and is in the process of, of developing an app for iPhones. Software developer by day and language revitalizationist by night, Anderson's research focuses on the intersection of language revitalization and technology. Her current language work includes the NSF-funded APS pilot project for the Indigenous Language Manuscript Interface to create an enhanced digital experience with Tunica language materials housed by the American Philosophical Society. And presenting her with her today is uh, Eliz Elizabeth, as I mentioned, who is a language and cultural lifeways instructor for the Tunica Biloxi Language and Cultural Revitalization Program, where she's responsible for facilitating learning of the Tunica and Biloxi languages and culture. Elizabeth collaborates with Tulane University linguists in the Kopani Yoyani Luchi Yoroni, or Tunica Language Working Group, developing Tunica language foundational resources including linguistic texts, manuals, curricula, and pedagogical materials. She participated in the Institute on Collaborative Language Research, where I met her, um, during 2016 and 2018, and biannual training, a biannual training workshop in field linguistics and language documentation for linguistic students, professors, and members of indigenous language communities. Growing up in the Tunica, Biloxi, and Choctaw traditions of her family, Elizabeth has spoken Tunica since she was a child. Uh, Ranigawara um, Montgomery Hill is Tuscarora, from the Tuscarora Indian Nation and is a speaker, linguist, and language activist who is focused on the creation, uh, dissemination, and perpetuation of the great law of peace within his community. He is a 2020 Loose Indigenous Knowledge Fellow working to translate the great law of peace, essentially the constitution of the Iroquois Confederacy, into the Tuscarora language. He received his PhD from the University of Buffalo and is currently also a postdoctoral fellow at McMaster University, where he is working on a project to develop a decentralized network of language revitalization programs. And our last paper will be presented by uh, Rene Lance Twichel. Um, he lives in Juneau with his wife and bilingual children and is from the Klingit, Haida, and Yupik Native Nations. He also carries um, uh, names in Haida. Um, he speaks and studies the Klingit language and advocates for indigenous language revitalization. He is an associate professor of Alaska Native Languages at the University of Alaska Southeast and has a PhD in Hawaiian and indigenous language revitalization from Kahaka Ula O Kee Ke Oh Hawaiian Li Kolani um, College of Hawaiian Languages at the University of Hawaii at Hilo and is a Northwest Coast artist, musician, and filmmaker. Lance is a 2019-2020 Digital Knowledge Sharing Fellowship recipient. His project is titled Maintaining Accessible Collections for an Endangered Language, Media Management in the Klingit Language Revitalization Movement. Hope you'll join me in welcoming each of these presenters. Kenny Hotu. Uh, I will let Elizabeth, uh, my name is Patricia, and I'm going to hand it off to Elizabeth to kick us off. Kenny, Ima Elizabeth Mora, uh, Elizabeth Preet Mora Etisa, Ima Taluchi, Sara, Ima Tawurini Luchi Roni. My name is Elizabeth Preet Mora, and I am a Tunica language instructor. I am I work for the uh, Tunica Biloxi Language and Culture Revitalization Program. I've been working with our program since 2014 when the program began. Um, in 2018, we were awarded um, the ANA Language and Preservation Maintenance Grant. Um, I'm going to ask if um, Maggie could uh, look to the next slide. Um, these are, our, uh, are, are the current five language apprentices um, who have been working with us since 2018. Um, they're, in, they're currently in their third year of the uh, mentor apprenticeship and um, they've been learning Tunica uh, language and 
um, training to become teachers of the language uh, while gaining experience in language uh, reclamation effort, uh, methods, including uh, transcription of primary language documentation uh, with uh, special focus on uh, Mary Haas uh, uh, materials at APS, um, specifically the Mary Haas notebook, uh, notebooks and there are 14 notebook, notebooks within Mary Haas's collection um, of, of uh, Tunic language. And uh, here on the screen, Lapuya Akawitiki uh, in Tunic, we say uh, welcome. So uh, I'd like to welcome you to our, our talk. And um, I'm going to pass it on to Patricia. And uh, if Maggie could flip to the next slide. Yeah, so when we were invited to do this talk, uh, community-based language revitalization, uh, many, many topics came to mind. Um, we've been working on this for a long time, uh, and in the case of Elizabeth and her family, their, their whole lives. And so, but since this is hosted by APS, we thought it would be um, an interesting thing to talk about of just how our relationship to these documents that are in APS has changed over particularly over the last 10 years as uh, revitalization has really started to gain, gain mass. Um, and so when we started, we just had these uh, published books on the left here. And Mary Haas was a very uh, talented linguist and, and did uh, these as her, as her dissertation actually back in the 30s. Um, and uh, so we use those as the authority. Uh, very few people uh, could create any tunica um, early on uh, as a lot of, of words and phrases, uh, but phrases and new tunica. Uh, we, if we had a question on how to do it, we'd go to these published materials. Haas was our authoritative source. And we finally got access to the manuscripts at APS and also at the National Anthropological Archives in DC. Um, unpublished manuscripts, uh, we still use them as sort of this authority. Um, Haas's published grammar is 140 pages and her unpublished grammar is like 670 pages. She had a ton of material that was not published. Um, but as time went on and more people spoke Tunica, we started um, having discussions about what is more understandable, you know, if we use something that's a, a full word, it's fully morphologically complete versus Haas's really um, shortened forms. Um, and so we started uh, changing the grammar. Speakers started changing the grammar and then the teachers and the materials uh, that also started changing. So our use as Haas as an authority uh, really changed um, as we started using our own materials as kind of the authority on grammar and how you say things. Um, slide please, Maggie. Okay. And um, as, as we continue our work, we create new uh, materials in Tunica language and uh, especially pedagogical materials um, as we um, teach uh, Tunica language within our community. Um, here on screen on the right you see um, Ruina Tawuru Luchironi, the Tunica language textbook which is in publication at this time. It includes dialogues and titimilis. Titimilis are cultural narratives um, these are all um, original, um, new original um, um, works in, in Tunica language. Um, um, we've also created games um, for teaching. Here you see Tunica playing cards uh, that was made by one of the apprentices. And um, we play, you know, games such as go fish and battle in Tunica language with um, our youth at um, language classes and um, the annual summer camp and um, immersion workshops. And so while we um, started, you once we started using these materials as more authoritative, Haas is no longer the first place we go to get grammar authority. Slide, please. Um, however, we still use these notebooks and these unpublished materials a lot. Um, these materials are not very searchable. Uh, they are, thank you, Brian, for posting. Uh, they are, you can find them online. However, they're all handwritten PDFs. And so we are constantly returning to them for different reasons. And one of them is just to see what new vocabulary is in there. I feel like every time we go to the notebooks, even though we've been accessing them for years, we find new things. Again, because it's sort of serendipitous. I wasn't paying attention to that page that last time, and now I am. 
Um, and so here at the top, we see this construction uh, for to uh, shake hands. And below it, uh, in, the, in the top one, we see Henny to greet a person. That we knew, that was in Haas's published material. But this above construction of shaking hands, which is literally to grab and greet, um, was uh, grab and greet, uh, yeah, uh, grab and greet the hand, um, was not uh, was not present. And so uh, that was something that immediately started getting used as part of our uh, interactions, uh, introductions and whatnot in lessons. Uh, same with uh, finding, like finding new ways to make colors. We would have students ask, how do I make these shades of colors? And one day someone was looking in the Haas notebooks and was like, oh, we know this is not a construction we'd considered before. Um, and so we do still use the Haas notebooks um, in a very different way. Uh, vocabulary is just one. And uh, we'll do a slide and Elizabeth can talk about a few more ways. Along with uh, new uh, linguistic information, um, we have located um, genealogical and cultural information. Um, here you see, so social Yushikong, um, Alice Picot and Kodachi uh, Kid, these are uh, three elders from our, our community. Within Mary Haas's notebooks, we found Soso uh family tree. Um, so there we see the names of his relatives and how he referred to each person in Tunica. Um, we've also located um, information about the singers that uh, Mary Haas recorded. Um, during the, her, her time in, in Marksville, Louisiana, uh, where our tribe was located during the 30s. Um, Alice Picot, who's here in this uh, picture, uh, she was one of the singers. Um, and um, we've also found information regarding the instrument that he used while she was uh, recording. And um, it's, it's interesting, he actually, he used a pewter ice bucket. Um, so he, he used something that was, um, you know, just around at the time. Um, and uh, more importantly, we, we found um, information regarding gender roles in Tunica Biloxi song and dance traditions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's, a, you know, an excerpt from Haas's notebook itself. You can see um, she has drawings. This cultural practice uh, that she's discussing here is face painting, and particularly it's actually around a larger conversation about stickball. And so this information, we've gone back to these notebooks, uh, kind of, again, finding slightly new things every time. Um, and uh, this information has been really key in some of the other revitalization work that's happening alongside the language, for example, uh, the revitalization of stickball among our students as well. Next slide. We've also, um, the apprentices, I should say, have located names of uh, two mythical beings um, that weren't mentioned in Mary Haas's uh, published uh, Tunica texts. Um, so we, we found uh, the names of these two beings. And what we did was um, for um, an immersion workshop, um, we developed an activity um, where learners created images of, um, you know, these two beings, um, well as, you know, other, other, other um, creatures in, in, in our traditional stories. Um, and students created stories um, some, you know, original stories and some um, elaboration on um, on uh, the older traditional stories. Um, so these are examples that you see here of some of the students' illustrations and, and um, stories that they've written in Tunica and English. Next slide, please. And so what we are particularly excited about, all these things we've mentioned, we keep finding and we keep finding new things because the Haas notebooks are so difficult, They're, you have to read them and we haven't had the time or resources to be able to get them in a searchable format. So in collaboration uh, with APS, uh, we will be working on a project to not just digitize them in the scan sense, but actually make them searchable, transcribe them, get them into the updated tunic orthography and add sort of a whole host of other information around those, uh, around the text, culture information, folks, uh, 
stories from uh, students and speakers today um, and actually make a larger digital archive uh, that can really bring these, these textbooks, these books um, to a really searchable light for not just students and learners, also researchers and for uh, hopefully pilot something that could be useful for other um, collections in the APS library as well. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and Elizabeth, I don't know if you have final, any final words. Uh, uh, Tikach. <laughs> Trant, <laughs> language revitalization. Hi, uh, my name is Montgomery Hill, or Ratnagawiri, means like uh, he stirs the water. Um, I'm a Tuscarora Beaver Clan, and I live, uh, well, a little, little, a little bit far away from my traditional uh, territory up in uh, Niagara Falls. Um, I just finished up doing my PhD in uh, language revitalization linguistics at the University of Buffalo. Um, and I have been working on language revitalization in like this community context for maybe uh, almost 15 years, 14, 15 years. Um, it's sort of been a, a ongoing and sort of ever changing thing as we've been, it's, it's very much in flux. The language is very much its own organism. It's made up of, you know, it's attached to the speech community, which is always flowing and growing and changing in and of itself too. Um, and I'm very thankful for you all to be sitting here and uh, taking the time out of your day to be sit here and be listening to what's going on. And um, so I, I would sort of hope to share a little bit about what's been going on with the Tuscarora Language Revitalization Project, the, the Tuscarora Language Efforts, uh, I'm an integration in my community, the things that I've been working on. Um, so, and I guess uh, the starting point or maybe be a little bit, it's kind of like an ending point too. Our last uh, L1 fluent speaker passed away uh, 2018. Um, so it's gonna be about a year and a half now. Uh, yeah, it was around last August, I wanna say, in the, or at least in the fall. Um, so it's been a little bit. Um, and so that's sort of, that point right there is something that I, tend to focus on and tends to occupy my mind a lot when I'm doing language revitalization work because it represents this interesting point where the way that people currently talk about language revitalization is that it's all about you know the existence of L1 speakers and intergenerational transmission and all of this. And one of the questions that has always occupied my mind when I am doing language revitalization work, when I hear about others doing language revitalization work, is sort of like this fear of what happens when we run out of L1 speakers, when we run out of fluent speakers, and so on. Like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And the, it's always this fear of the end. And I can tell you, you know, from my experience, 
it is what it is. I mean, you call it unfortunate or not, these things happen. Is that after our last L1 speaker passed away, the language that I, you just heard me speaking, the language that I use with my kids, the language that I speak at ceremony, it didn't suddenly change from a living language to a dead one once our, our last speaker passed away, our last Ellen, Ellen Fluent speaker passed away. Um, it just, that's just not what happened. It wasn't the end of the world. You know, we still have our language program going. Um, right now we have uh, adult language students. We have a, a good crew of around uh, seven or eight people. And what we found is that, well, I guess um, I'll backtrack a little bit. So one of the main things that's helped us get to this point of getting to building this, uh, I guess a brand new speech community out of, I mean, they, they are family, they are, they are relative, they're not strangers, um, but it's still people, you know, it's still almost like a brand new thing. Like we are something that we're creating uh, from the ground up because none of us, we didn't, we didn't receive it collectively from the generation above us. So what we're having to do now is spend our time collectively creating something that we are going to be passing down intergenerationally. And I think one of the more powerful things about that is that we had to abandon um, a lot of these traditional models of language revitalization and what that's supposed to look like. You know, there's um, like this idea of the master apprentice or having elders and sort of things like that. We have, we can't do that in our program right now because it is not valuable to give any one person that's speaking the Tuscarora language that's working with us sole authority on how the language is to be spoken or how it's supposed to be or what it's supposed to sound like. Um, in English, you know, even you don't have that. You have, I mean, this, this, this thing that they teach in schools of how things are supposed to be, but you, the people that go, you know, if you think about all the people that get really picky about grammar, um, be really picky about punctuation, how it's written, blah, blah, blah. They're not necessarily people you want to spend time talking to or being <laughs> or be around with, right? So that's one of the things in, in language realization that you really had to, that really doesn't even get talked a lot about in the literature, they talked a lot about the speeches. It's just a matter of you, and on top of having to have an understanding of the grammar, having understanding of the knowledge, having an understanding of the culture of everything that's going along with it, uh, one second. Sorry, I wanted to apologize for that. Um, <laughs> um, so, okay, so we have that, and then we still have the problem, and I think this is one of the things that I'm very thankful for with for our partnership with APS, is um, the, this ability, the, this thing that we're all con always constantly rec uh, wrestling with, with ourselves, is that, <clears throat> well, we wanna be doing the right thing, right? So. One of the easier ways is to just give the full authority, sort of um, what the, our previous presenters were talking about, you know, to this inanimate thing, the, these texts to say, okay, this is what grammatic, this is what grammaticality is, right? Um, but the reality is, like, okay, that's the easy way out, <laughs> mostly because, um, you know, we just say, you can say, okay, point to the book, the book doesn't have any feelings, we don't have to deal with the book taking out any of its feelings back on us, right? And the second of all, it really doesn't get force you to into an uncomfortable position of having to deal with growth or change, um, which is something that it's a that's a whole talk to itself. But I think that you know, if you speak to if you are an indigenous person or you know indigenous people that you feel com that are comfortable enough to talk with you about this, like this notion of remaining this notion of remaining traditional, remaining authentic, and so on. It's a big struggle that indigenous people have to deal with and so having these books having access to the APS it's really um, important to form this the proper relationship to it uh, so it's important to understand that it can't replace an elder it shouldn't replace an elder and in reality like this position of authority that will we feel comfortable giving these texts sometimes 
is that it's not really helpful or healthy for a language revitalization because there are always new things that we're going to have to be dealing with. Um, and there, I mean, they're just, okay, so like new technology on a very basic level, right? Um, there are the fact that as indigenous people, as we're growing, as we're healing from the processes of colonialism, a lot of the people, a lot of the, document, the documentation that happened was by people that, what was with people who had directly been impacted by boarding schools or you know, indirectly impacted through intergenerational trauma caused by the boarding schools. So the, beyond this like really superficial level, oh, we're gonna need words for technology, there's also this very deeper level of we're going to need new ways and words of engaging with ourselves as indigenous people, as people that are healing, to be able to talk about our emotions, to be able to understand authority, to, to understand all these colonial power structures that are really mediating our social relationships with each other. And so one of, I guess one of the things, um, just as a final note, that I am really thankful for that we have in this community revitalization is our people like the APS who have or and are constantly working on the process of opening up their resources and sharing them with us without sort of any any sort of strings attached in a, in a way um, we're very thankful to have all these recordings and everything given to us um, we have hours 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 of things that we're transcribing and working on and so on and so forth and also that the fact that they had been they've been given to us they they work here at APS to give us this resource that they had and I think that there is as perhaps you know doing language revitalization it's not always um, work that is always welcomed or given resources in your community so the the recognition from any outside institutions um, reaching out, giving us these, these things that, to help us in a way, whatever we need to take them and use them to help us is something that is uh, incredibly valuable and uh, something that is an attitude. Um, the attitude that they take here for indigenous people, you know, is something that is very healing, especially because it opened up, up opens up the door for ourselves as indigenous people to be like, okay, well, why? If we can have this institution helping us with minimal strings attached, we should be able to do the same for each other and our own people. And that's something that I, you know, I keep in I keep in mind for doing our work. And I'm again, I just want to say thank you to APS for inviting me here to help. And um, especially with the work with the Center for Native American Indian Research, this is one of the main uh, places that we got one of the many things that served as a catalyst to get us to the language revitalization program that we have in Tuscaloosa today. So uh, thank you everyone. Now. Okay. Good as cheese, you hon. American Philosophical Society. Benjamin Franklin uh, Thank you to the panelists who, who went before me, and I want to thank the American Philosophical Society. Uh, I feel if Benjamin Franklin was here, he would say, you folks are the Zoom masters. So I really appreciate the work that goes on behind the scenes, uh, including the extra work that, that we put upon you, just trying to figure out how to, how to do this uh, from our homes. And I just wanna send love and support to everybody. Uh, you, you might be working from home. You might have your kids, you're trying to keep your kids kind of at bay and also sort of engaged in, in school and, and much love to all the teachers and everybody who's, who's really trying to make this work and not trying to just make a, a fuss and make things uh, worse. And so uh, my name is Rene. Uh, I teach at the University of Alaska Southeast. I am uh, very honored to do work in the Tlingit language. Uh, we also support um, 
Hatkil, the Haida language, and Samalgich, the Simshan language, with our work at the University of Alaska uh, Southeast. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oya, ek a queen, he de yashunayel adi hakusti da ye jene ka yukatangi. This is uh, words that were given to us by Chukatin James March, uh, an elder who, who left us about a year ago. Uh, and she's told us uh, it's as if you all are leading flowers this way, working on our culture and our language. Next slide. Hakusi a work hawk has to yetki, has to yanak as it seen. A joey na yetki you has to a sock. Our culture, this is Shagoon Sophie Smarch. Our culture, uh, the people, their children, they, they value them so much. This is why we call them children of the clan. Next slide. There's a spirit in everything. Uh, so this is foundational to some of the work that, that I try to do and, and that a lot of us do here in Shingitani. Uh, now I'll show you where we're at. We're in Southeast Alaska and also Western Canada, uh, a land base that's about 54,000 square miles. Uh, there's 17 Shingit communities and I think 12 of our communities have language programs. Um, and I'll tell you folks a little bit about our language as well. Uh, next slide. So the, the really challenging part, and, and these are pretty rough estimates, but you know, just sort of thinking what our population might have been uh, right around the time of uh, intense contact with, with colonizers, and then how this triggered a massive decline in speaking. And so the, the number of speakers uh, goes down the, the population probably dips quite a bit and then rises. So uh, this does not show the population of Tlingit people. This is talking about the number of speakers of a language. So when we think about a language, we want to look at how many speakers there are, what are the ages of the speakers, are there new speakers, are there children who are being spoken to? Uh, and so the, these are some of the things that I start looking at when I think about the Tlingit language. Next slide. And the, the difficulty, so this is this, so this shows about the, the top of what I think our population currently is about 25,000 Tlingit people. Uh, and then the number of speakers, which looks really, uh, and so this is second language speakers, so not birth speakers. So can, can we teach people to speak Tlingit when they, when they grow speaking English? Uh, even if they're around the Tlingit language, they, they might not know how to speak. And so, it's pretty alarming to see like one, one trend going way down and then this other one not really rising fast enough. Uh, but if we could see the next slide, uh, we'll see that we, if we zoom in, this is, this is what I think we're looking at as well, is we, we went through this trend where there was wonderful work being done to document our language, to develop materials, to teach our language. But for a variety of reasons, we weren't really creating new speakers or creating people who could understand and who could talk to you about the language but just to be able to speak it um, i do think we're on a rising trend and, and so we're trying to uh, do the best we can to stay positive to figure out uh, like some of the things that that monty was saying is i am not interested in perfection i am interested in communication i i, I want someone to be able to tell me their thoughts their feelings their speculations in our language. Uh, and so if we keep stopping them to try and get them to make it perfect before they tell us their, what they wanna say, then I think they're gonna walk away. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this is the Tlingit language. Uh, so we, we have a large territory, we have dialects, we have Kwan's. Uh, a Kwan is um, 
people of an ancestral place. And so we have several of these, and these are um, basically states within a nation. Uh, and then within these Quans, we have uh, many clans, over 70 clans. Uh, these clans intermarry, they, they claim names, songs, land. Uh, and so all of this, we try to really incorporate all of this information into the language we're teaching so that we also, we don't want students to be able to just speak classroom language and just name things and talk about things that they might see or hear in a language learning environment. But we want them to uh, really be versed in, in our culture. And that includes sort of, sometimes we got to say this is how we used to do things. We don't always do things this way. So we're not trying to shame anybody for how they're living, but we do want people to understand uh, kinship structures, clans, how to talk to people, how to do things in our language. Next slide, please. We, uh, we love consonants. We got a lot of them. Uh, we, we have four sets of vowels that have uh, four variations, although one of them does have six. So we have 18 different vowels, although they, they sort of operate in these, in these groups. Uh, and then we have many consonants. And so there are 61 total sounds in Shingit. Uh, we've developed a writing system over the years. Uh, it's been contentious at times, uh, but there is a writing system where you do have one symbol for one sound. Uh, and then we've had to make a few adjustments in recent years about particular sounds we're hearing. Um, and just to really try and honor the dialects and just say, you know, we're going to do our best to teach everybody the language. We'll do our best to teach you the language for your particular dialect. Uh, but we really want people to know that the dialect difference is not a reason to, to avoid learning the language. Like you, you can make those adjustments much easier if you already know the language. Uh, next slide, please. So a, a lot of the things we do is in partnership with uh, folks at Kahaka Ula Oke'ilikelani, the College of Hawaiian Language. Uh, and one of my kumus there, uh, Pila Wilson, William Wilson, uh, he, he talked to us about language revitalization, and this really uh, struck a chord with me, which is uh, language revitalization is about two things, protecting the speakers you have while making new ones and making sure your language is the language of power and use. And so everything you do, I think, in language revitalization should come back to those two things. And if it doesn't actively contribute to one of those two things, then don't do it. Because there's, there's very few resources, there's so much to do, there's so many distractions, there's so much internal fighting, there's so much fighting from external sources, people who are trying to tell you what you should be doing, uh, that it's really easy to just stay colonized and to not truly decolonize through your language revitalization efforts. And so for me, I, I just continue to come back to this when I'm trying to decide what I should do because I have piles of work, I can't keep track of stuff, I'm trying to you know, uh, take care of my kids and, and you know, trying to deal with this uh, traumatic pandemic and um, and so I just I tend to come back to that okay next slide and so what what I wrote in my paper uh, is really just talking about some of the things that we are trying to do so we're trying to over overcome genocidal efforts of colonialism we're trying to push colonial value systems out of the center of our operations as individuals and as organizations we're trying to uh, look at some indigenous theoretical models that can help us, I believe, to sort of indigenize the field of linguistics uh, so that it's not a study, a scientific study of the language, but it's, it's an effort to, to reshape society so that we, we, put, we keep our language in this very treasured uh, area so that we understand everything we want to leave for our future generations we should be trying to do through our languages. It's a direct tie to our ancestors. It's a direct tie to the ways that they thought and the way that they talked about the world. And so we, we come back to some of the words of our elders who, who just talked to us about love and kindness and helping each other and respecting things. And we try to keep that as a, as a central focus to what we do because when you revitalize a language, you're also going to be digging around in areas of pain and trauma, and that pain and trauma can easily transform into violence. And so that, those are the, some of the things we try to sort of uh, take a look at. Uh, next slide, and this might be the last one. So one of the things that, uh, that I've been working on, uh, and I wanna thank uh, the American Philosophical Society again uh, to for a digital knowledge fellowship and also the Luce Foundation for um, 
a fellowship through the First Nations Development Institute. So a lot of my work uh, is through teaching and also trying to make resources accessible, which gets me into difficult conversations regarding copyrights and plagiarism and, and other types of things. But my feeling is make it easy to find, get people to find it. Uh, and, and I think if you look at the numbers, it, it's, it's working. And so this doesn't mean that every one of the people who are on here are gonna become speakers of Klingit, but I could, we could say, you know, the, there has been a dramatic increase in accessibility of language materials. And so the two areas I try to do this is through YouTube, where I'll record every class that I teach and I'll upload the videos of the class to YouTube, and then clinkitlanguage.com, which is a blog that has access to those YouTube videos, handouts for each of those classes, and then every piece of Clinkit language material I could find, um, which has, you know, people shoot arrows at me because I'm putting stuff out there for people to have. And I understand not everything is for everybody, but when you're in an absolute and total crisis and your boat's about to sink, it, it's not the time to talk about like who gets to claim what. And, and so for me, I operate on the philosophy that, this belongs So this belongs to our future generations, our little grandchildren. And because of that, we're going to work on this place where we, we, we reserve a spot for them. And I think a colonial model and a capitalistic model and an academic model, they, they, get, they just cloud everything because you're supposed to you know, pad your... Uh, your CV and, and you're supposed to have these certain number of publications and you're supposed to have the, and, and it's, it's a challenge too, because within your own people, if you, if you do a bunch of stuff, they, they might start coming after you because, you know, um, it's, just, it's just a product of the environment. But I'm really thankful. Uh, I look forward to the conversation that we're gonna have. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to see more, uh, you can read the paper. Uh, and thank you to, um, to everybody for Listen, Kalchish Achi Isa Achi. All right. Uh, thank you all so much for these papers. I, I knew, um, I mean, I read them and I knew they were going to be fantastic and, and they absolutely were. Um, so we have a couple of questions that have come in um, and I'm going to try to um, both kind of address the specifics of the questions and, and broaden them enough so that everybody can respond to them. Um, and, and one of them from Ian McAlphin, um, or McAlpin, um, has identified a theme that has come up on a number of your um, a number of your talks and areas that you've been discussing, and that's this kind of tension between authority and authorization and kind of innovation, um, but also individual, um, the right for kind of individuals to um, uh, produce things and, and change things or not change things, right? So these can be questions of standardization, they can be questions of um, interpretations or reinterpretations, right? Um, language variation even in the making, um, depending on the context. Um, and so I wondered if, if um, everybody would like to talk about that or if, if specific, you know, folks would like to talk about those questions of kind of um, authority and authorization within the language and those the kind of um, tensions that come up when trying to do this work. I don't know uh, what, what maybe go in paper order or um, or not. I don't. Does anybody raise their hand? Is that Let's do paper yeah. Okay. Um, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll start, and um, I'm Elizabeth. You know, uh, definitely jump in or can chat about it as well. So uh, the Tunica language community it, um, does differ a bit from uh, the fellow uh, pointing, but I don't actually know if this is what they are on my screen. Our fellow, our fellow panelists, uh, language communities, and that when we started. Um, revitalization, there were not uh, native speakers or elders um, at the time. And so this is why for us, the Haas materials for us were sort of our, our gatekeeper that we'd go to for uh, right language and wrong language. And um, it has just been a very different context for us. And then that shift, um, I very much loved what um, uh, Hunai said about um, that this language belongs to our, our great grandchildren. Um, and so for us, it has always been about uh, what what can if it, if it if it 
I'm a, I'm a linguist again, the politics of heart. I know not everyone shares this, but for me, language is if you say something and I understand it, that's language. Um, and in the uh, Tunica context, we have um, not had too many uh, single people uh, or, or groups of people uh, kind of contending with that. So it's been very different. Uh, we have hit it in other ways. Don't get me wrong. We've hit this issue of authority. Um, it's just been a sli slightly different. Uh, so um, for us, we have actively changed the language that we found in documentation specifically because uh, something was said and a learner didn't understand it. Um, and so we've we've shifted the forms intentionally. And I know, um, Elizabeth, you've done a lot of work with this, um, anything, especially in the work with our apprentices in the last few years. Um, you want to comment about, about kind of, especially the apprentice work around that? Okay. Um, I, I, I can't think of a, a specific example um, of, of what you're mentioning here, but, um, Working with, um, you know, Tunica language uh, documentation um, and, and, you know, working with uh, Mary Haas's documentation, it comes from, you know, 1930s and um, the main speaker that she worked with was Sisostri, um, who we showed in, in our presentation. And so he was, you know, the single, um, you know, speaker that she worked with. Um, and, you know, um, in, in, in Tunica, um, there's, there's uh, female and there's male um, forms. Um, you speak to people according to, to their gender. Um, and so what, what I'm trying to say is, you know, that there, there are some gaps in, in the documentation. So we mostly have, um, uh, language samples from a male speaker um, and not all um, there's there's some words you know that that aren't there um, um, as I was reading the question one example that came to mind was um, you know we, we have a, we in, in Mary House's documentation we have a word for can't but um, you know the 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 form for can, you know, would be just the opposite. Um, so uh, we have Stukaha, which is in Mary Haas's uh, uh, published dictionary, but um, the opposite of that would be Stuk without the negative postfix. Um, so that's, you know, a, a simple example of us um, you know, expanding um, the language. Um, you know, that, that's available to us. And, and you know, there, there's many um, neologisms, new words, you know, that we've, we've um, added, you know, to, to our new dictionary as, as we've gone along and um, as we've worked the language and, and taught the language within the community. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's, what, that, that's what comes to mind. Um, if you wanted to um, add a little bit more to that, uh, Patricia. Or if anyone else has, um, yeah, so we can pass it on to uh, Monty. Are you you next in line? All right. So I was just looking at the written text of the question, right? And he talks about being anxious as language as language rebuttal as recent efforts continue. If young people will change the language, and it's like young people will change the language, so you can choose to be anxious about it or you can choose to work with it. And that's it, ultimately that's, that's what's gonna happen. Um, you know, the language that we're getting from our speaker or we were getting from our speaker, you know, it wasn't the similar. And what had happened in a lot of our communities that I think in some way it, it made things, some things a lot more flexible to understanding is that uh, Tuscarora is one of six um, existing Haudenosaunee languages. And these languages are all, inter um, mutually intelligible. So what would happen is like if you had a mom that spoke Tuscarora and a father that spoke Mohawk, you could you would probably end up speaking both or like some combination of both. And there was a lot of these borders between languages were less st structured and strict in general. 
right? And like, you know, if you were trying to speak Tuscarora, you would generally try to be speaking Tuscarora, like, you know, in much of the same way. I'm using an academic vernacular right now. I'm not going to just start doing my res talk right now in the middle of this talk, unless it was like, you know, something, you know, I really got really passionate about. Um, I generally try to control. So, you know, so it's a matter of like proper decorum, you know, like just try, if you're going to be speaking a certain way, just stick to speaking the certain way. It's a, you know, and just sort of having that understanding. And it's a matter, and I think Lance brought this up, it's just a matter of focusing on the fact that people are communicating. So it's more important to have people talking than being afraid to speak. And that that's the, uh, so, you know, it, that's ultimately it really is to sort of, you can either have this environment and attitude toward language based on anxiety or this environment and attitude towards language based on growth and connection. So, um, you know, it's something, uh, there's a lot to be said to just looking into the community's history of intergenerational trauma. Like just start there, just look at it and be like, you, there's a lot more to what's going on with our people, with our language programs than our language programs. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would add, uh, if your language isn't changing, it's, it's probably dying. Uh, that's probably one perspective I would have, which I know some people would, would push back ag against. But uh, I, I guess my, my one of my number one things is watch out for uh, the colonial researcher who's uh, trying to use purism as a way to tell you that you're not something. You know, for example, like so somebody comes in from outside of, of your indigenous nation and, and they do wonderful stuff. But then the, the people start trying to do stuff and then they start saying, oh, well, you're not like the old people used to be. You're something different. And so I, I'm, I really try to sort of just put that stuff right in the garbage and, and just say, you don't get to define who, who we are. Uh, and, but then it, it's, it's a spectrum. It's something that it's a complex spectrum of things because you can't just do anything any old way. So we really try to take the things that the old people told us when, when we were learning 20 years ago and, and really trying to figure out how to become uh, basically some of the first second language speakers who were born of the indigenous group and, and we're trying to sort of figure out how to overcome the all the traumas that, that, you know, I think becoming a speaker of an indigenous language means you're going to try and overcome colonial genocide, which is 400 years of incredibly intense white supremacy and indigenous erasure. And so if you're doing that, like really, as one of our elders said, a pat on the back never hurt anybody. So just congratulate each other, support each other, lift each other up, celebrate when someone starts making those steps. And, and you know, it, be an open book in, in terms of receiving criticism and critique, but also just realize when someone's just trying to knock you down or hurt you and then just disregard, just completely disregard that stuff. Because I, I tend to carry a whole bunch of stuff and, and it affects me and it, and it hurts me and, and people use hurtful language and words and some of them are, are my elders and, and sometimes they'll tell me that we're going to ruin the language and I understand where folks are coming from because they hear us talking and it sounds nothing like the, the people that um, they know. So this a friend of mine, Tindak Pangi, is a Chamorro from Guam, and he says, I speak my grandmother's language, but I don't speak like my grandmother. And so it's not like we're just letting go of everything, but we're, we're doing the best we can. We're going to be second language speakers. We're going to sound funny. We're going to sound bad. But I, I really believe in safe spaces where you just let everyone, just let them make the mistakes. And, and Sometimes go in and, and teach from the mistakes, but don't stop people from talking. Don't shut them down. Don't, you know, make fun of what people are doing. And, and we, I catch myself doing this. I catch others doing this. And, and this is just a way that we, we hurt ourselves. And I think we've been programmed, like the, the program has been put in there for us to just kill ourselves collectively and to just die away. And, and that's, that's the desire of the colonial mechanisms, which we have to be real about. And so to, to move against those is to do it in a way where we're, we're creating something that's different than has ever been before. Because uh, I tell people at an individu individual level, if you don't speak the language now, you cannot be the same person living the same life. You have to make that adjustment. And that also goes for us as well. We have to create those spaces where we can, we can engage in that because maybe we'll say, oh yeah, we've been putting the emphasis in the wrong spot on this, or we've been doing this wrong, or I'm a teacher and I've been doing this wrong, which is, you know, why you've got to have 
if you have them, you get this group of old people who will, will be kind with you, you know, cause sometimes, you know, we all, we all, all get a scolding and we'll all give some scoldings now and then, but we, we gotta just make sure that that's not the only thing that we provide. So that's a great question, Nachish. Thank you. Um, so we are coming up on our time soon, but I did want to say, and there are some questions that are specific to um, each of the papers. So maybe we'll have a chance for, for people to reach out um, and respond. But I did want to say one of the things that's come up over and over again is not just that flexibility, right, and, and addressing things and, and um, being creative. Um, but I think one of the things that's become really obvious and is a uh, um, an absolute drum that I beat on a regular basis, right, is the importance of the historical context, right, the specificity of communities and languages and dynamics, right, so um, Chickasaw, we are always right next door to a very, very closely related language, our, our siblings, the Choctaw, right, and, and so when we're doing things, or if, and also kinship-wise, right, we have lots of, um, we don't always get along, but we have a lot of relationships, right, and, and those kinds of resources, um, and so those kinds of things are important when we um, are thinking about that versus a, a language like Tunica, which is a isolate, right? Is that, um, so, so you can't call your sibling or cousin language and say, how are you guys saying, um, saying this? So I think um, that kind of specificity is also really important um, and brings up what Monty mentioned that you can't just kind of um, cut and paste what kinds of programs you have and what kinds of things you're doing because one community has, um, you know, 600 speakers and um, no money and the next community has six speakers and a lot of money and right I mean I think even the level of documentation and resources these are all so different across our communities um, and our histories are there's a lot of similarities but there are also some differences um, thinking of my own community being removed from our homelands right and so there are a lot of things that I know communities do um, that are are continuations of things that are are thousands of miles away for us so um, I, I don't know if anybody wanted to speak to to that um, for a minute. I think I think they've allowed us to go over just a little bit um, to to talk to kind of that dynamic as well. Yeah, well, I guess I could add something, which is uh, I think it is a very well documented language. Uh, a lot of the documentation documentation that we had though was sort of like individuals telling stories or uh, making these pretty big speeches at, at events and so trying to learn from that is basically like taking someone and they don't speak English and you're going to teach them and you're like okay so here's the complete works of Shakespeare you know because it's just a different type of language when you're in that environment so uh, some folks that that do work with us uh, Alice Taff just had this brilliant project where she just wanted to get elders together and just get them conversing and so you're getting this conversational more day-to-day -day stuff they're cooking and they're talking and laughing and, and so we, we got so much wonderful material from that and so but one of the things that I did is, is I went to the elders with some of my colleagues uh, and we just asked them we said what what do learners need to hear in order to stay focused and motivated and positive because I, I think if everybody who started to learn thing it like stuck with it we probably have a thousand speakers right now, but we, we have, you know, uh, about 150. And then if you say like, who could really talk, it, it gets down to probably about 40 right now. And so we, we are in this decline. And so sometimes students are really up against it. And, and even if they, they as they keep going, uh, someone once said, I, I feel like everything that I know is, is in this glass of water and, it, and it's pretty much full and I was like oh that's great that's great and then she turned she's like and there's the ocean and that's what I need to learn and she started crying and we all started crying and so so you got to have those check-in moments I think sometimes where you're just like really trying to get your group to to stay positive and stay together and, and not not hurt each other and not hurt anybody and just really make uh, some of those healthy sort of decol decolonial lifestyles part of your language teachings early on and just say like this is safe space this is, we don't hurt each other here and we're committed to sort of doing this together and this is the group the group has to be strong on the inside uh, to insulate itself for the the horrors that are going to be coming from the outside and th those horrors might even come from your own people and so uh, it, but I'll use those words directly and, and then and say this is what they this is what they said to us and and now you get to understand that and 
and just to try and get students to understand like there's these old people who can talk and, and you're going to be able to, to talk to them and you're going to be one of the only people in the world that can understand them and then you're going to watch them pass away and, and it's going to be really really hard but you're the one who carries that to those next generations and so just really trying to boost them up all the time and, and using the words that our elders gave us Monty, could you uh, rephrase or restate the <laughs> lens is really good. Got a little um, lot just lines. yeah, just thinking about the um, the kind of um, the specificity of of communities and languages and particular moments, right? And and the um, a lot of times the differences across histories and and um, particular dynamics, right? That yeah. that are important. Yeah, I guess in like a very personal level, the main thing about language revitalization is like connecting to the other people around you who are also doing it and understand where you are and how you fit into it. That's like the, the best thing that I can offer. And like, it doesn't, that doesn't take any academic training. It doesn't take any of this. And if you need, you know, the backup or the, this um, authority, you know, you can be like, oh, well, Dr. Montgomery Hill, he said that, you know, it's important to have the, the personal connection for language revitalization. Like that's the number one thing. So if you need that <laughs> for going back and, you know, figuring that, that out. And Lance, too, he said the same thing. So now you got two indigenous doctors. You know, you got everything that you need. Um, you know, I'm sure we could find you more if you need it. But really, you know, that's what I mean. That's what it's to you. I think you really are getting at when you talk about the hyper specificity. You know, as indigenous people, there's really not even that many of us, right? And so when you talk about authority and you talk about, um, all these sort of like bigger abstract concepts that we have or are ingrained in us in the colonial mentality, having attended, you know, American public school systems, having to participate in the workforce, having to participate in uh, secondary schooling education, like we have these really abstract notions of like how these social institutions work, and none of them are really what we need for our languages to survive. So a lot of it is unlearning and like addressing all these things that are, are really, uh, that can really be done without any, you need just really changing, just, un, just understanding the people around you and who you are and how you relate to them. That would be my number one thing that I would tell in terms of like specificity like that, really. Yeah, I, um, I agree with, with many of those things. And I do think that um, this, yeah, the state is just, is just so, it's going to the, the kind of um, the kind of struggles and, and, and roadblocks that we've run into are, are very different um, because of the specificity that we have. And even though Tunica is a language isolate, however, we, you know, it is a Southeastern language, a uni language of the Southeastern United States. So we have even gone to Choctaw, which isn't linguistically related, but you know, how, how do we build days of the week? Um, that's, you know, that's kind of a, a European construction anyway. Um, and so, how, how would we do that? And so we've actually, you know, we have uh, used a mix and match of strategies to fill in those gaps that Elizabeth mentioned. Um, and gaps that our, our speakers want to know now because they have, there are all of these constructs that didn't exist at the time that the, the language was documented. Uh, the way politeness is done in English, which is the native language of most of the speakers of Tunica, it was different than it was done in Tunica. And so please and thank you were some of our first words that were created for language revitalization. Um, and we're just now getting to the point where we're actually using endings of, of doing commands that are polite uh, rather than what we started at, which is sort of the neutral, uh, you know, go take out the trash. And now, so we, we've started to build on that giving um, answering those questions that learners had really on, I'd like to say, please go take out the trash, rather than going into a, well, we wouldn't say that in Tunica, that's not really a thing, you've used this ending. Um, we made please and thank you. Um, and as we're, as folks are getting more comfortable and feeling confident in their language, we're starting to add even more um, nuance to it. Uh, and mostly through uh, demonstration is usually how we, we uh, part of our teaching method is immersive. And so the teachers, we, get together as a group and all kind of the teachers talk about, okay, now we are going to try this new thing that we haven't done yet. Um, and then when students ask about it, when students start noticing, then, then or we might explicitly bring it up, um, 
but it's kind of a, as we go uh, type of thing, which is why we keep going back to the documentation at different times, because now we as the teachers and Elizabeth, you can uh, speak to this more too, like we now have questions. They're like, oh, we don't have, we have a few different ways to say to live a place, but like what really are the differences and how do we want to have those differences be known and communicated? Um, and that is just really specific to the, the way that since we don't have anyone we can ask and say, how would you say this? Um, and uh, having a community that though then really starts with saying that, you know, we know the language from this documentation and then also getting away from the documentation holds the truth has been this balance being that you hold the truth once you and your friends agree and you use it in our dictionary session about neologisms, then okay, like I'll write it down, I'll add it to my dictionary, or not my dictionary, the dictionary. Um, and uh, so kind of figuring out how to um, get learner creativity as well as teachers who are also learning new things as we go. It's been, it's been we are the only community that, that's done that, but it has been, you know, the folks that we find connection with over these processes. Um, have been different and not necessarily the community that are right next to us um, that we we learn from in this way. Elizabeth, oh, no. did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, sure, I'll add a little bit um, just to um, add on to what Patricia was saying. Um, yes, uh, Tunica is an isolate, um, but because of where our tribe is located in central Louisiana, um, you know, we have um, a lot of uh, similarities or, or um, um, words, um, the tra traditions that we share with other tribes. Um, um, Louisiana, especially central Louisiana, because of westward uh, movement of tribes, you know, towards uh, Oklahoma, um, you know, we, we have words from Choctaw. Um, and uh, as it is, our, our tribe is, um, you know, an amalgamation of uh, four different tribes. So, um, you know, we have words from Biloxi, which is one of our, our, our tribe is Tunica Biloxi. Um, yeah, uh, um, aerial, aerial calcs, um, if you're familiar with that, you know, uh, similar ways of saying things. Um, and, um, and, and, and thinking about, you know, how, how we decide to use uh, the languages, the, the, the language um, and, you know, uh, post fixes within the language. Um, you know, when we first approach, when, when we first look at Mary Haas's uh, materials, um, some of the, the post fixes within the Tunica language, it seems like they're limited, but, you know, as we use them, um, we decide, you know, that you know, no, this, this, um, this postfix, post it, it isn't restricted. It, it is, it, it doesn't have to be limited. We can use it um, in um, this, this, this way. Um, the, an example that I'm thinking of is, um, you know, how we say, you know, don't do something, ya ahatan. So tan would be the uh, polite um, uh, imperative postfix, um, but, you know, if someone was one to say, you know, something, say, you know, don't do it in, in you know, in, in a stronger sense, um, we could use maybe he or, um, or chan, um, if the ch uh, speaker, you know, chooses to do that. Um, uh, th that that's all I, I wanted to add. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. I think we have, um, We've, we've stretched past our time, although in, in Indian time, we're actually still early to start. So um, a, a thank you to everybody um, for, for being on time and for providing this amazing conversation. And I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Adriana to kind of wrap us up. Thanks so much, everyone. This has been such a delightful session to, to listen to behind the scenes. Um, I wanted to just remind everyone that the conversation is not over. Uh, we have two more sessions tomorrow. Uh, scheduled for 1 and 3 p.m. Eastern Time. At uh, 1 p.m., there's a session on community-based archival initiatives, and that'll be followed by engaging digital archives to meet Indigenous communities' uh, priorities. So um, I hope you will uh, join us again tomorrow. And um, please join me now in thanking again this really wonderful uh, panel of speakers. It's lovely to see you all, and I can't wait until it's safe enough for you all to return to the APS so we can see you again.
So thank you.